Hey everybody, it's Captain Nabs, and welcome to the next installment of my Embraer 175 tutorial series. So far we've gotten the aircraft through the startup process, we've gotten a takeoff done, and now we're going to do a bit of an easy one here. We're going to go through the climb, cruise, and descent phases of flight all in one video. Most of the performance of the Embraer 175 is pretty conventional, so we're just going to talk about a few uh, specific quirks to watch out for and give you some tips on operating the aircraft in the cruise, climb, and descent phase, including uh, appropriate speeds and system usage. Let's dive in. All right, everybody, welcome back into the flight deck. We've just finished our takeoff and uh, cleaned up the aircraft, so the flaps are retracted. We've done the after takeoff checklist. So the first quick tip I'm going to give you is that normally most operators set a speed limit before they turn on course. So for most operators, it's usually going to be 210 knots or something in that range. It's a reasonable speed with the clean configuration. However, it keeps us from going too far in the wrong direction. So anytime you're on a radar vector after departure and you're going to be turning around and going the other way after departure, you want to keep the speed to about 210 knots until you're turned on course. So once you get a vector on course, and you're about 90 degrees or less from your on-course direction to your destination, that's when you can start accelerating. And the Embraer does like to fly faster. It tends to fly more efficiently and give you a lot better margins when you fly fast. So once you've got turned on course, you want to accelerate to 250 knots pretty much right away, unless there's some kind of traffic re restriction or other restriction on your departure. Otherwise, we normally accelerate to 250 knots right away and get the airplane moving on course. Now before we go any further, a quick word about Climb 1 versus Climb 2. So there's two Climb Thrust settings in the Embraer 175. There's Climb 1 and there's Climb 2. As you can see, Climb 2 here, if you were to be able to select it, it gives you a much lower power setting. Climb 1 gives you a much more powerful climb setting. The trade-off being, of course, that you're going to have a much higher engine wear than uh, with Climb 2. So a lot of operators don't like Climb 1 at all. They avoid Climb 1 at all costs because the wear on the engines usually does not make up for any efficiency by getting to altitude faster. So as a general rule, once it becomes selectable, when the aircraft gets a little bit of a update to the thrust selection system here, I would plan on always using Climb 2 in all of your climbs. It's going to give you very reasonable climb performance and it's going to provide a lot less wear and tear on the engines for your operator. As you can see, we've now passed through 10,000 feet a moment ago, so we're going to go ahead and do our 10,000 up check. So the first thing we do, of course, is turn off all of our landing and taxi lights. We leave our nav, our strobe, and our beacon all on. And then we'll normally turn off our sterile light at this point, and that signals the cabin crew that they're able to get up, move around the cabin, and start doing their service. And then depending on the conditions of the day, you may want to put your seatbelts on or off. As you can see, I did not set this up properly, but normally we would have had them on. We'd turn them off at this point. So that's the three steps of the 10,000 upflow is normally lights off, sterile light off, and seatbelts as required. And then basic airmanship principles also dictate that we have two more items we need to check on our 10,000 up check, and that is first of all a pressurization check. Just have a look, make sure that the cabin is climbing, make sure the differential is reasonable, the altitude has shown some climb from our departure elevation, so usually we'll be at about 2,000 feet through 10,000. In this uh, early access version, the uh, cabin uh, rate is lagging a little bit. And the second thing is you'll want to make sure that you set the guard frequency on COM number two. If you're operating in North America anywhere, you want to make sure that you have 121.5 tuned up on number two so you can listen to anybody on the guard frequency. And that's it for the ton up checks. Very easy. So the other thing you're going to want to do when you get above 10,000 feet, of course, is begin to accelerate the aircraft. Now, there is an FMS speed mode available in this aircraft. However, in the early access version, it's not active. But most operators will normally fly with an economy speed, economy speed, and the aircraft's FMS will give you the most efficient speed to operate based on your supplied cost index. So normally, you would take the outer ring of the speed bug here and actually move it over into FMS mode, and then uh, it'll accelerate on its own to that ideal speed. However, in this early access version, that does not yet exist, so we'll use the more generic 290 Mach 0.74. So if you don't have economy speed, most operators like to operate at 290 and Mach decimal 74. So once you're above 10,000 feet, accelerate to 290. When you get up to about 28, 29,000 feet, you'll transition to Mach decimal 74. That gives you a very reasonable optimized climb. And if you don't have uh, a planned Mach number in cruise, again, 
290, Mach 0.74 is an excellent uh, plan for cruise as well as for descent. So 290, Mach 0.74 should be your general targets until the performance economy system comes online in later versions. As we're flying along on this beautiful day, you don't see a single cloud in the sky, so you don't need to worry about the icing systems. But what about the icing systems in the Embraer 175? Well, like everything else in this aircraft, it's pretty much fully automated. So you'll find the ice protection panel here on the top right corner. And basically all you can do with this is deselect the various systems. So engine one, wing, and engine two all will come on automatically when needed, but you can also deselect them if there's any kind of failure in the system. As you can see, there is a mode switch here and it normally stays in auto. There's a separate section called, there's a separate position called on. So there's ice detect probes on the nose of the aircraft. There's two of them for redundancy. And when ice is detected by these probes, then the ice protection systems will come on automatically, the engine anti-ice in the wing. So you'll see a message in the ICAS indicating engine anti-ice on, wing anti-ice on, uh, but you won't actually have to do anything. And once the ice detect probes no longer detect icing conditions, those uh, messages will go away and the systems will close. So you don't have to do anything unless there's been a failure. The only time I've ever had to do this manually is if there was a failure of the ice detect probes. And that can happen from time to time. Uh, if the ice detect probes do fail and they are MEL'd, then what's going to happen is you're going to go ahead and just manually put the ice protection system to on anytime you enter a cloud. And you'll see the anti-ice mode uh, not auto switch come on. And you'll also see status messages come up for the other anti-ice systems that are running when that mode is in, in uh, manual mode. As you can see, the anti-ice systems are not coming on. It's not been modeled yet in this aircraft, but in a later version, it will come on automatically or manually when you move that to the on position. Normal operations, we would never use that and turn it on manually. It's only really if the ice detect systems have failed that we'd use that manual mode. One other thing you'll notice about the anti-ice system is that there is an automatic test that happens the first time an aircraft passes through 10,000 feet on each flight. So once you climb up 10,000 feet, the anti-ice system will switch on automatically to test itself. You'll see it come on for about uh, 10 to 30 seconds, depending on how cold it is outside. And once the wing and uh, engine intake elements have heated up enough for the anti-ice system to determine the test has passed, the system will go off again and the message will disappear. So again, once the system is fully implemented, you'll see this on your ICAS as you pass through 10,000 feet on every flight. Another cruise tip for pilots is, of course, turbulence penetration speeds. So let's say you start running into some rough air. It doesn't look like we're going to do it today, but if you do start getting into any rough air, you'll want to select the proper turbulence penetration speed for the Embraer 175. Below 10,000 feet, this is 250 knots. Above 10,000 feet, this is 270 knots or Mach decimal 76. You want to be less than those speeds if you're entering turbulence. Light turbulence is not usually too much of an issue, but anything above light turbulence will definitely want to be below those turbulence penetration speeds. So one final thing you'll need to watch for in cruise here is just keep an eye out for potential fuel imbalances. There is a fuel imbalance limit on the Embraer E-175. It is 360 kilograms. So if you see the fuel quantity difference between the two tanks differ by more than 360 kilograms, you're actually going to get an ICAS caution message indicating that the fuel balance has exceeded the limits. It's pretty easy to balance these out. There is a fuel transfer switch right up here, fuel crossfeed. And if you bring up the fuel page, you'll see exactly what it's doing when you do a fuel crossfeed. So all you need to do is figure out which tank has the lower tank. So in this case, the right tank is lower, not by enough to really be worth it, but we're gonna do it for a demonstration purpose. So you go low two because tank two is low. And what you'll see is that the crossfeed valve opens and the low two selection forces the pumps on the left tank to run and shuts off the pumps on the right side so that the fuel is forced from the left side into the right side or into the right engine more specifically, although some of it will transfer from tank to tank. You'll also see you get a fuel crossfeed shutoff valve open ICAS message appear. Once you're happy that the tanks are balanced, you can go ahead and close it again. It is important to note that if you in any way suspect a fuel leak from your aircraft, do not cross feed between the tanks. If you understand the reason why the fuel tanks are imbalanced, either one engine is burning more fuel than the other, or perhaps you sat on the ground for a long time and the APU burned a lot of fuel out of the right tank, but not so much fuel out of the left tank, uh, you may want to do the fuel balancing. But if you're at all in doubt about whether or not there's a fuel leak that's causing the fuel imbalance, do not perform the fuel cross feed procedure. 
One more piece of information you may want when you're cruising along up here at the high levels is how soon you can do a step climb. For that information, you can look to your FMS and go to the PERF data page. So on the performance menu in the bottom right corner is the PERF data page. And this will give you some information about the route you're flying and your destination, fuel on board when you get there, everything. But uh, what you want to look for here is the ceiling altitude in the top left corner. And this is the FMS's estimated current ceiling based on the uh, weights that you provided, the ZFW and the fuel load currently in the airplane. So you can see right now we're slotted to cruise at flight level 310, but according to the FMS, we have enough performance to actually make it all the way to 410. If you're flying a heavier airplane laden down with more passengers, you may see it uh, start to come down to maybe 370, 350, and it'll actually uh, account and adjust as the aircraft burns fuel, and it will increase that ceiling slowly as you fly. So come back to the PERF data page, number one, and you'll see the current predicted ceiling for the aircraft. So as we're approaching our destination, we're going to have to start setting up for our arrival into Boston today. In the Embraer 175, a lot of the stuff is automated for you, so you only have to do some of the more basic steps to actually set up for your arrival. We'll have to set up our approach minimums, and we'll have to make sure that we set up our landing speeds. When the fully completed version of the FMS is available, there will be an auto-tune feature that is part of the real aircraft that will actually automatically tune the localizer frequency and set the inbound course when you're 150 miles, 150 miles from your destination. So assuming that you set it up correctly in your FMS, arrival, runway, and approach programmed in here, so the ILS via 22 left, at 150 miles back, you'll see the frequencies will automatically switch and you'll also see the blue preview mode come up on your HSI. So what this will look like is another arrow with the inbound course. So for runway 22 it's going to be about 220. You'll see a little blue uh, course indicator appear here on 220 indicating that you've got preview mode available. So you'll actually be able to see the localizer before you actually engage localizer mode while you're still in FMS mode. So you'll see that trigger normally at 150 miles. That doesn't work right now in the current version, but I'm hoping that uh, in one of the upgrades when the uh, FMS is completed, that uh, the auto-tune will become available. Since the auto-tune is not available, we're going to have to tune on manually here. So we'll go over to the radio page here, and all we have to do is type in the frequency that we need. So uh, looking at the chart here for the ILS to 22 left in Boston, the frequency we need is 110.3. So type in 110.3. And you could just put that right onto the green active frequency of NAV1. And what you'll notice is that this green active frequency right now of 110.5 gets moved into the standby. So 110.3 is now the active frequency 110.5 got put in the standby. You don't always have to put the decimal point in. The radio tuning function in the Embraer is actually pretty smart. So if you put in 1103, it should automatically know to put a decimal in there at the right spot. And uh, so you can use these shortcuts to actually tune your radio a little bit faster. Ditto with COM frequencies. Instead of typing 24.000, you can usually type 240, and it should tune in 240 or whatever you need. If you need 228 for Unicom, just type in 228, and it will automatically uh, interpret what you've typed in. So there are some rules. You'll have to kind of learn the rules, but uh, you can actually type in the frequencies a lot faster. You usually don't need the preceding one because the one is assumed for all the frequencies, so you can usually just do the significant digits after the one and just put them in, and the tuner will automatically figure out what frequency you're trying to tune in. So we've got our nav frequency tuned in there right now, 110.3. The other thing we're going to need to do is set up our minimums for this approach. So we have two sets of minimums on the Embraer, and you'll notice that because I tuned in a frequency, it automatically switched to VOR mode. Make sure you go back to FMS mode. This shouldn't happen in the real airplane, and this is a, a limitation right now of the system we've got going on right now, but it will become better in the future. So we'll get back into LNAV mode here. So we're back on course with LNAV. So for the minimums, we've got uh, two types of minimums. We've got RA or barrel minimums, radar altimeter or barrel minimums, barometric mi altimeter minimums. Uh, RA minimums are used for doing CAT 2 and 3 approaches. For our normal CAT 1 approach, which we're going to do today, we'll switch this over so that it is now in barrel mode. And you'll see that barrel is the number that appears down here. The barrel always counts in intervals of 10. So for our DA here of 216, we'll always round up. So whatever the next interval is, and we'll round up to 220. So we'll set our barrel minimums to 220. And there we go. We've got barrel 220 set. And the only other thing we'll need to do is make sure we have our landing speed set. So we go into our performance page, and we go landing. And we'll have to just fill in some of the data for our landing today. So I'm just going to assume a standard temperature right now of 15 degrees. 
and select your landing flap configuration because this will of course affect your ref speed. So whether you want a flap full or flap five landing. Normally the landing in the Embraer is done on a flap five configuration. Flap full is safe for generally shorter runways. Anything less than 7,000 feet, you'll want to consider a flap full landing. Also, if uh, the runway is wet and contaminated and it's less than eight or 9,000 feet, you may want to consider a flap full landing. But most normal dry runways, 10,000 feet long, uh, you're going to want to do a flap five landing. It's a little more comfortable, it's a little faster speeds, makes it work a little nicer. You'll also need to select whether, you have, whether you're expecting to have uh, the anti-ice system on or not for the arrival. This will actually uh, increase your speed if you're going to plan to land with the anti-ice system on. So we're not anticipating any ice today, so we'll leave it at no. We've got flap five. We've got our weight has been calculated automatically based on our ZFW. And we can then go to the landing page and it gives us our landing speeds here, which will also appear on our speed tape as soon as we start uh, the approach here and slow down to that point. So our VREF for today is 128, VAP 133, uh, V approach climb 134 and uh, clean speed will be 184 knots. And again, you'll see flap 5 conf confirmed over here. The VF speed is normally VREF plus 5. However, this may be increased higher during gusty conditions to provide you a little bit of a higher margin above VREF. So you can type in any speed you want. So if you want to add an extra 5 knots and make it VREF plus 10, you can type that in and override that speed. But normally, you'll want to leave it at VF plus 5 unless it's a gusty day or you've got an extremely strong headwind. And that's basically it. That's all we have to do to get set up for our arrival, assuming that uh, everything is programmed into our FMS flight plan correctly. That's all we really need to do is tune the radio, set the minimums, and verify our approach speeds and our configuration for approach. And that's it. You can now do an approach briefing, and you can get ready to do your approach into Boston. One more thing I should point out as well is that currently there is no active VNAV planning in the Flight Sim Studios Embraer 175. There will be in when the FMS system is completed with the version 2 FMS. However, for now, the VNAV does not really exist. So you're going to have to look at all the restrictions on the arrivals and make your own vertical descent planning. When it is finally implemented, the VNAV system in the Embraer 175 works wonderfully. You can set any speed and altitude constraints that you require, and the aircraft will decelerate to meet any speed restrictions you set in there. It will plan its descent properly to uh, meet those altitude restrictions. The only tip I'll give you for, the, for when the VNAV does come into play is don't let the VNAV actually start the descent. There'll be a descend now button, or you can press uh, the VNAV button early to start the descent a little bit ahead of the top of descent point. And the reason is because most of the time, you tend to fly this aircraft pretty close to the red line. And with the auto thrust system, it won't back off until it sees a speed trend. So if you're close to the red line, and the autopilot starts pitching down fairly aggressively to catch the VNAV, as it sometimes does, what will often happen is you'll end up overspeeding the aircraft before the auto thrust system has a chance to bring the engines back. So starting the initial descent at about 1,000 feet per minute with a descend now button that will appear when you're within uh, 50 miles of your top of descent point helps to smooth out that transition and make sure you don't overspeed the aircraft at top of descent. Uh, many a pilot has been caught by the Embraer and has overspeed the aircraft on top of descent by waiting for the VNAV path to capture. So smooth out that initial descent, and you'll have a much nicer time in the Embraer 175. So that's it for my climb cruise descent video. There's uh, really not a whole lot of magic to flying the Embraer when it comes to the cruise and descent phases. It's a pretty typical airliner. It flies uh, much like all the rest of the airliners with a fairly advanced FMS system. Once everything is implemented, this is going to be a really great airplane, and I'll probably have to redo this video once all the features like VNAV are finally implemented in this aircraft. But for now, this should be enough to get you going. In the meantime, have fun out there, fly safe, and we'll see you guys all in the next video.